Hi all, Raidwald here. This is a video in response to a video Vernaculus made, responding to Stefan Molyneux in his claims that rights don't exist. I actually come down on that question uh, on Vernaculus' side. I do believe rights exist as a legitimate and useful concept in philosophical discussion. However, um, I chose this this video response vernaculus as a means of uh, as a platform for addressing your views specifically on rights. Uh, I I see that uh, such views tend to be more and more common nowadays, and I don't believe that they are valid. I think that if you put some serious thought into what rights are and how they are to be employed and what should be accepted as rights, then you really run into some, some issues when you go beyond the framework and concept of rights that um, at least are insinuated from Stefan's position that um, he would accept as the only legitimate type of right. Uh, and, and you argue against that in some uh, sense. That being said, I'm going to be more liberal than I usually am in cutting out parts of this video. I'm going to, despite that attempt to maintain uh, the integrity of all the arguments I'm actually here to respond to, um, but I, I want to keep this video short, or at least relatively short for you guys. Alright, let's get started. Rights are supposed to be universal. That's the, that's the, whatever, the first premise of his argument. Where he got this, I have no idea. Rights are not universal in the world today, no matter how much we would like them to be. However, one right is hotly debated in the first world in regards to the right to keep and bear arms. If rights are supposed to be universal, then this right would not exist. Okay, um, I'm going to start off with a couple definitions here because I believe it will save us time in the long run. Well, I'll start first with a definition of rights, then I'll uh, cover the type of rights that it's clear he's considering the only meaningful uh, kind of right. So first of all, I would define a right, a claim which can be considered justified by default when made by or in behalf of any human individual. And secondly, I would say, at least uh, in my own case, in my own definitions, uh, that the only legitimate kind of right is a natural right. That is, a right which can be enjoyed in the state of nature by all human individuals equally and simultaneously. There are some key characteristics to these rights which must be noted. Uh, first and foremost, these rights are uh, considered to be the heritage of all humans by their very nature. They are not given by any state, government, or society, and therefore cannot be taken away by any state, government, or society. Um, at least not justly. Right? No, no just government can claim the authority to remove that which is uh, yours by by right of your nature, right? Natural rights are supposed to be those rights with which uh, we are born and that are inherent to us. They are considered inalienable, as Thomas Jefferson so nicely put it in the Declaration of Independence. Uh, again, this just speaks to no government can or ought to have the authority um, to alienate an individual from these rights. So let's look at the consequences of these definitions. Uh, first of all, such a right or just claim as a natural right would indeed be universal among the human family. What you're doing here is you're saying that because rights are not universally applied respected or enjoyed that therefore those rights do not exist universally. Uh, this is not true. It's, a, it's actually a non sequitur, right? Um, 
if I make a just claim, or rather if I make a claim that is just, that says nothing as to whether or not I get to enjoy that claim. Most people would accept that I have a just claim to my own life, a right to life. However, that does not negate the fact that somebody could walk into my house tonight and unjustly, by definition, violate that right to life. All right? he, can, he can ignore my just claim and remove from me my life. Doing so, however, does not negate the fact that I had a right to it. I had a just claim. It just means that, by definition, his violation of that claim was an injustice. By definition, natural rights are restricted to negative rights. That is, the right to not be interfered with when I am engaging in peaceful activities. Right? So, these key uh, negative rights, which are commonly referred to by those who are proponents of natural rights, um, including the vast majority of the founding fathers of the United States of America, and you can see uh, this definition and understanding of rights clearly um, baked into the, to the United States Constitution. Um, but anyway, uh, the, the main ones, the main natural rights that people look at are the rights to life, liberty, and property. Um, there are other natural rights that spawn from these, uh, the right to peaceably assemble, the right to uh, speak freely, um, because in order for somebody to prevent something like this, right, you cannot prevent my assembling with those I choose to uh, without without using force, without stepping in with, with uh, guns or threats of violence and breaking up a peaceable assembly, um, which in itself would be a violation of negative rights, right? It, similarly, um, someone who claims to have a right to not be offended is claiming uh, is claiming as a right a positive right, the positive right for some party to change their behavior in order to afford them what they think is their due, right? If, if, if I have a right to not be offended, that means you do not have a right to speak your mind. If you have a right to speak your mind without being interfered with, then I do not have a right to, to not be offended. Uh, negative rights and positive rights, as it would sound, seem by the name, are mutually exclusive. Which brings me to the example you just posed. Uh, the right to bear arms is not directly the negative and natural right we are talking about here. It is, uh, rather, that natural right would be the right to defend my life. Right? If, if I have a right to life, then I have the right, the authority, and really the responsibility to defend that life from those who would take it from me. Um, now, I also have a right to own property by nature, uh, to keep the fruits of my labor. That, uh, and, and then, of course, the right we already talked about to peaceably assemble, um, to voluntarily associate with those I, who would uh, voluntarily associate with me. Taken together, all of these will provide a right for me to own any piece of property that I could possibly own. Um, provided that property is not a person to whom rights uh, should be afforded by nature, right? If As soon as you endeavor to own a person as property, you have gone beyond, uh, you, have, you have actually violated their natural rights, which means you have forfeited your own. In summary, I have a natural right to defend my life, to own property, or rather the fruits of my labor, and to voluntarily engage in interactions with those who would voluntarily engage in interactions with me. Therefore, I have a right, a natural negative right, to own and bear arms, provided I use those arms only in the def defense of, of my own life and rights, or justifiably the rights and lives of others but never in the violation of somebody else's right to life, liberty, or property. 
the right to freedom of speech is not universal in the entire world. So that doesn't exist. Again, let's just look at the fact that a right is a claim which is justifiable or justified. Um, all humans have a just claim to speak their mind without the um, violent interference of others. This can be expressed as the freedom of speech. The fact that the freedom of speech is not enjoyed universally, not respected universally, does not negate the fact that it exists universally, that all human beings uh, have a just claim to this. But notice how he starts off with rights are supposed to be universal. Yeah, he, he probably should have started with some definitions himself, but uh, it appears as though he was trying to keep this video under seven minutes, and so he simply assumed an understanding of rights based off of the centuries-old conversations, debates, and, and philosophical quandaries that, that have uh, been centered around that topic. Uh, as a fellow American, I find it hard to believe that you were not, at least in some sense, briefed on these understandings and concepts, these classical liberal ideas about the nature of rights. Um, I can't get how you would be able to read even the Declaration of, of Independence without coming to an understanding of, of these rights. In fact, you don't even have to have read the entire Declaration of Independence. You only have to be somewhat familiar with one of the most uh, famous phrases from it, i.e., we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If these rights are indeed unalienable and endowed by our creator upon us, whether that creator be a god, gods, or uh, nature, then you can, you can gain from this that um, these rights are inherent to us as human beings and that they are universal and that they cannot be denied to us. They are unalienable by any uh, governmental body, uh, collective, or society. Where did that come from? Who set this criteria uh, for what is necessary for something to be a right? It's been commonly accepted, at least in terms of natural rights, uh, for centuries. I'm sorry you've been so completely unaware of, of that conversation. It's a rich and, and deep heritage with some very important real-world consequences. Some people in the Middle Eastern world, uh, ISIS in particular, believe that it is their right to throw homosexuals off the tops of buildings and stone them after they've hit the ground. But since that isn't universal, therefore it doesn't exist as an actual right. I see you're beginning to comprehend the implications of holding ourselves to natural and negative rights, right? Um, the right to violently interfere with someone who is peacefully living their life is, well, to say the very least, it is mutually exclusive with that person's right to life, their negative right to live peace of, peacefully. Therefore, ISIS, or anybody else for that matter, who claims to have a right to end a peaceful person's life, has uh, gone beyond the realm of natural rights and is now claiming something else. I still have no idea where Stefan got this idea that rights need to be universal in order for them to be rights. It just seemed like he plucked that out of thin air. Western classical liberalism. Uh, it goes back centuries, it's being killed off today by people who don't understand it. Um, it's worth your while. Look it up. Study it. Know it. Become it. What does he even mean by rights need to be universal in the first place? Does he mean that everyone in the world needs to believe that this particular thing is a right? Does he? What he means is that any claim that can be considered just by default for any human individual needs to be just by default for all human in individuals. Otherwise, we run into such problems as you brought up earlier, uh, that some people would claim the right to deprive other peaceful and otherwise inno innocent people of their lives. You mean that this particular thing needs to be protected under the law in every country before it can be a right? Is Were that the case, then no government could violate the rights of their citizens, right? 
if only that which is legally respected by the local uh, political entity is a right, then no political entity could ever violate a right. If all rights come from the government, then there are really no rights. Uh, if rights come from our nature as human beings, then they can exist universally even if they are denied unjustly for some. Does he believe that any reasonable human being needs to think that someone has the right to X in order for it to be a right? He doesn't seem to make that clear, which allows him to continue as he does. You're right. Uh, he's not making the case that has been made and understood well for centuries. Um, he's just trying to consistently hold, or rather hold people to a consistent application of those principles uh, because we've slipped from that and we're seeing some rather dire consequences of that slippage. Um, consequences which you yourself often speak out against. The next part of the argument. Every group claims to have special rights. So different people claim to have different rights as opposed to other people in the world. Uh, there are people who disagree on every right that supposedly exists, therefore those things aren't universal, and in order for a right to exist it needs to be universal, therefore no rights are actually rights, and rights don't exist. But still, notice how he just hit you with the, with the criteria that rights are supposed to be universal, which is a premise in his argument that he just pulls out of nowhere. That allows him to say the thing that he just said and justify his statement, which he pulled out of nowhere. He pulled it from the Western tradition of classical liberalism that goes back for centuries. Um, that's not nowhere. If you had some familiarity with it, and some familiarity with these concepts, then you would understand both where he's coming from and the implications uh, of where he's coming from. But let me turn this around on, on you. Do you believe that there are rights which can be held by some people and not by other people? Are there rights reserved to some privileged few, i.e. claims that are just by default for certain people that would be considered unjust by default for other people? If so, by what principle do you ever, ever restrain this? Where does it end? How is it limited? If you were to accept such a definition of rights, then what you have essentially done is destroyed the concept of rights for anyone. And if you knew something about the historical concept, or context rather, of natural rights and why these concepts came forth, you would understand this, right? The idea of natural rights came in response to claims of, of the divine rights of kings, right? A, a, a stance of absolutism of authority in the government. The idea there is that there is one person, a monarch, who has an absolute right, a privileged right, a unique right, which is not shared by other people, to do as he pleases with any and all other people. This monarch can deprive anyone of their life, liberty, or property at, at his whim. And this is supposed to be accepted either A, because he is divinely appointed by God to fulfill that, per that position, or, as uh, Hobbes had put it, because he's simply the biggest, baddest dude and nobody wants to fight him and ultimately it's best for society to have some order, even if it's imposed by just the biggest, baddest tyrant. Rights are not a useful concept, in his opinion. You cannot take away an objective property of something. So, self-ownership and the capacity for rational thought are objective properties of human beings. Well, there are people who are mentally incapable of rational thought, and that's not an insult or anything, but there are human beings around who are mentally damaged and incapable of rational thought. And he claims that self-ownership is an objective property of human beings. So I thought to myself, what is self-ownership? Why is he claiming this is an objective property of human beings? So I looked it up, what self-ownership is, and I got this interesting definition. 
Self-ownership or sovereignty of the individual, individual sovereignty or individual autonomy, is the concept of property in one's own person expressed as the moral or natural right hmm, of a person to have bodily integrity and be the exclusive controller of his own body and life. Now, I am in agreement with you that this is where Stefan Molyneux starts really going wrong. Um, I disagree with you in, in how he's necessarily uh, necessarily doing this, right? Um, Self-ownership can be considered a right, as defined in that definition. But what is ownership? Ownership, um, at least the most accepted definition I've heard of used uh, among libertarians and, and ANCAPs, such as Stefan, ownership refers to exerting a full range of control. Property rights, or the right to ownership, is, you know, so ownership can be considered a right, right? Uh, the legitimate full range of control over uh, something. But it also could be considered an objective property when you're talking about self-ownership, such as Stefan Molyneux is. For example, I have a just claim to speak freely. But could anybody who seeks to unjustly or deny me that claim really stop me from speaking? Can they exert that kind of control over my body? No, they could kill me in response for me saying something they don't like, but they can't prevent the words from coming out of my mouth. Um, of course, without gagging me and, and all kinds of stuff like that. But even, even doing that, uh, they really can't exert a full range of control over my body. I can think things uh, that they don't want me thinking, whether or not they agree with my right to do so. So, this is where I, I go. Uh, Stefan Molyneux, uh, I think, is actually speaking here about the, the objective property of self-ownership. Uh, I control my body, and until you restrain or kill me, uh, you can't prevent that control. Uh, there's nothing you can do, no coercion you can exert upon me that will prevent me from saying, thinking, or doing things with my body up until the point that my body is completely restrained or my life has been ended. He takes from that as a granted that this would lead to the respected ability uh, uh, for me to own my body and to do with it anything that is peaceful, right? Uh, I don't take that as a granted. Given the, the property of human existence that I ultimately ex am the only one that exerts a full range of control over my body, you can't necessarily take from that uh, the understanding that anybody else should respect that, that this claim can be considered, that the, the claim that I should be able to do that without interference uh, is considered just. This is where rights become a useful concept uh, for discussion in, in philosophy and in and society, right? Therefore, you can't take away a human's right to self-ownership. Well, as a matter of fact, that has been done routinely in history. Look at slavery. Some people thought it was their right to own other people which was a clear violation of natural rights, and therefore could not be a natural right. And different people thought it was their right to not be owned by other people. Even today, some people own slaves and believe it's their right to own slaves, so your objective property of human beings is not an objective property. Unless you look at self-ownership as the objective property that I am the only one that can conceivably ever at in any universe Exult, exert a full range of control over my body. And, beyond that, not only can no other person exert a full range of control over my body, but no other person can stop all uh, control over my body, uh, all range of action that I can take uh, without ending my life. Self-ownership is a right that some people believe in and others don't, and since it isn't universal, it isn't an actual right. It is universal, it just isn't universally applied, enjoyed, or respected. 
uh, ab capacity for abstractions, uh, free will, all of these things are properties which can be very reasonably argued for uh, as, as human beings having. I beg to differ. Uh, go ahead and disagree with Stefan all you want. Um, I clearly disagree with him on, on this regard as well, um, or at least in some details of the case he makes here and, and clearly of his ultimate conclusion. However, are you, are you actually trying to make the case uh, that human beings are not capable of abstraction or of free will? Which of those are you begging to differ on, and what's your case for the difference? So if it's, not, if it's not a property, if it is a property, let's call it a property, but it's not, because something being warm-blooded is something you can test and you can measure. Right? Mammals, do they give birth to life young or do they give birth to eggs? If it's eggs, not a mammal. If the egg is, if this thing comes out of the eggshell outside the body, it's a lizard or something. Or, you know, like a, a, a platypus or something, which is classified as a mammal and also lays eggs, but, you know, your universal claim is in danger, so we can just sort of toss that example aside. Right. Uh, considering that this is given an example uh, or analogy for his property claim of uh, of self ownership among humans, um, again, we're not talking about the right of self ownership, the respect from other people and or society that I'm allowed to do what I want with I uh, with my body, but the mere fact that I can do what I want with my body. Um, so that that's exactly, that is his point. That is his universal, that all humans have this kind of ownership of their body. Um, so finding a few examples that break the mold in his analogy doesn't necessarily strike down his original uh, proposition of a human, a universal human property in self-ownership. Now, he could have restricted himself to saying that all mammals have sweat glands. And yes, I know there are some notable examples that people like to bring up as having no sweat glands, such as pigs, dogs, elephants, rodents. Um, they actually do have sweat glands. They don't necessarily have them all over their entire body, and they don't necessarily sweat through them. But uh, pigs do have some sweat glands. Dogs have sweat glands, especially around the pads of their feet. Uh, same with rodents. Elephant sweat glands seem to be restricted to their, uh, in between their toenails, oddly. But uh, even in these examples, they have sweat glands. Um, and even uh, uh, nipples actually can be considered a type of sweat gland that uh, produces milk. Um, he could also have just restricted his example to that, the feeding of young through milk. Uh, but these, these again, the, <clears throat> they're analogies, not the actual point he's trying to make, just ways in which he is attempting to clarify that point to other people. Striking that down and declaring victory over him <clears throat> is, you know, especially in the way you were striking it down, with, with obscure exceptions to the rule, uh, it's, it's tantamount to a straw man, actually. Because his point here is not that all mammals lay or uh, have, give birth to life young. That is not his actual point. It's an analogy for his point. Okay, so in order for a right to have any sort of validity, it needs to meet one of two separate criteria. One, it needs to be an objective property, or it needs to be universal. Still, there's that random claim that he pulled out of nowhere. Your entire refutation of his point seems to hinge around uh, whether or not this criteria of universal is compo completely pulled out of nowhere by Stefan. Uh, and therefore, your entire point hinges around ignoring the centuries of history of classical Western liberalism. Now, I will say here that this is where Stefan Molyneux's uh, argument seems to be changing course from where I saw it going. Uh, he clearly is not concluding that rights do not exist, but that any rights which do exist must be universal. 
And if you disagree with that, then, then go ahead and, and, and argue your case as to why there should be rights which are not universal. But again, you need to, you need to really face up to the realities of the implications of that claim. If there is a claim which can be considered just by default for some people and not for other people, then where does that lead us as a society? I, I don't think you could ever employ such a definition of rights, uh, such a, a privileged instantiation of rights, without a smaller and smaller group of people having a larger and larger control of other people in society until you arrive finally at your destination of some sort of absolute authoritarianism, whether that be founded in a single head like a monarchy or founded in a single party as we saw in the 20th century uh, socialist regimes. It, it ultimately doesn't much matter. Absolutism is absolutism. And I, I really do think that the ultimate consequence of the idea that some rights are, uh, are not universal, some claims can be considered just by default only for some people, will ultimately lead to that. Uh, well, let's test this objective property of self-ownership people held slaves in the past well okay it's not an objective property of human beings because well all we need is the one counter example what you just did there neither refuted the um, property concept or the right concept of self-ownership uh, the fact that some people held slaves at some point in the past or even if they hold slaves now um, does not refute the fact that ultimately each individual has a full range of control over their own body which cannot really be ended prior to their death. Uh, you can in fact, you, yes you can uh, restrict the types of things they can do with their body but you cannot end all control that they have over their body. Uh, their body ultimately is under their control. Um, so you, you're not refuting that. Neither are you refuting the right concept of ownership, self-ownership, because, as we've already discussed several times, uh, rights are just claims. Claims can be denied un unjust unjustly and still be claims, still exist. Therefore, the right to self-ownership, if it is a right, has always existed and has only been unjustly or unjustly, rather, uh, denied to some people at some times in history. Or it needs to be a universal. Well, let's test that too. Some people thought owning slaves was their right. Others thought no one had the right to own anyone else. I guess it isn't universal. So what do we do now? The right to own slaves is not a natural or even a negative right. It is a positive right. It cannot be enjoyed simultaneously by all people equally. Going beyond that, uh, the right of slaves to self-ownership is not destroyed by the fact that their rights are being suppressed. Those rights exist and are being violated. While you have never, uh, at least not in this video, used the term violated in regards to rights, um, I'm sure you acknowledge the possibility that rights can be violated, which means that rights exist whether or not they are being respected. That, that's inherent in the concept of violated rights. So perhaps you actually uh, withheld use of this term specifically because you understood that it would destroy your, your entire argument. Now, if it's a universal, let's just call it a universal, which is why my theory of ethics is called universally preferable behavior. It's a universal. It's an abstracted, deals with everything uh, universal. So if it's not a property, then it must be a universal. And well, how convenient that self-ownership falls into one of those categories for you, even though it doesn't. I'm fairly confident that your little scheme of how rights can be considered valid covers all of the rights that you enjoy. I can't harp enough on the fact that he's trying to manipulate you into thinking that self-ownership is an objective property of human beings. 
the way his argument here is uh, constructed, he doesn't even need to do that. You could completely destroy the definition, uh, the possible definition, of self-ownership as a, as a property of, of humanity, and it could still be a universal. And by the way, he just gave you exactly what you wanted, a definition of what it means to be universal, something that is extracted and deals with everything. Now granted, he isn't being super specific in, in that definition because he doesn't clearly, he clearly doesn't mean everything, right? He's not saying that uh, universal principles of human behavior ought to apply to uh, whether or not, you know, well, to the, to the behavior of planets orbiting a star, right? That's, but since we're talking about the context of human behavior, then his universal principles can be universalized across all human behavior. Uh, and I think it's pretty clear that's what he's going for here. So you, you finally have your definition for what it means to be universal. It just isn't. It's a right that you are trying to pass off as an objective property. So you can sit there and argue that rights don't exist, but the rights that I like totally do because it fits into this arbitrary category that I made up in order for it to fit into that arbitrary category that I made up. You need to concede one of two things here. Either no rights exist, including the right, not objective property, of human beings for self-ownership, or you need to you need to reevaluate your stance on whether rights exist or not. It's your move. Or he could concede the point, the very point he just made, that the only rights ex which exist are rights which can equally apply to all people at the same time, i.e. rights that are universal, i.e. rights that are abstracted and deal universally with all human behavior. This may not be a convenient uh, point for you to concede, but it is a valid option in this scenario here. So it's not a physical property, right? They're not physical properties. Therefore, if they have validity in the realm of philosophy, they must be universal principles. And if they're universal principles, let's stop calling them rights. Let's just call them principles. So your conclusion is that if rights aren't universal principles, then they aren't rights. So we should stop calling them rights and start calling them principles. But you're just claiming that certain things are either objective properties or universal. No right is universal. There is always at least one person who disagrees on something, and so it's basically laid at the feet of objective property. But He never once in his video claimed that there's anything which is universally agreed upon, or that rights need to be universally agreed upon. He's never made that claim. That is your rather convenient interpretation of what he means by universal. And he did, in fact, give a definition of universal, at least in regards to his use of it in this discussion of rights. He made the claim that it has to be a principle, which is abstracted, and deals with everything. And he clearly meant deals with everything within the realm of human behavior and human interactions with each other. Uh, right, because that's the context of this conversation. That is the universe of discourse. So you need to address that concept of universal. But all you're doing here is naming something, something else, and then claiming that fixed everything. Well, you haven't. Teachers unions are saying, you're taking away our rights to X. And the only thing you're doing is making it so they're saying, you're going against our principles about X. Um, you may have forgotten this, which is odd, because you've been harping on it this entire video and, and misinterpreting it. Uh, probably willfully throughout this entire video. But he, he says universal principles. Uh, universal is a, is a key qualifier in, in this instance. So can you really make the claim that the principles the teacher unions are upset about are universal or universally, universally applicable? Right? They don't believe everybody deserves tenure. So when they complain about their rights to tenure being taken away from them, they're complaining about a non-universally applied principle, a highly specified, localized principle, which they enjoy and others do not. In other words, they are complaining about a legal privilege being struck down. A legal privilege which makes them, that, that takes them as a group and turns them into some sort of politically um, 
defined elite. People who enjoy things by default which other people do not. See, this is, this is what happens when you strike down this concept of uh, universal principles being at the heart of what a right is. You get people claiming rights, or again, making claims which are considered justified by default, um, which apply only to them and their little group of buddies and not to the rest of society. This is at the heart of every bad example of rights that you've given. Not that your example of them was bad, but the example of bad rights, right? For the, the right to throw gays off of buildings and to own slaves. That is at the heart of those claims. The idea that I have rights, I have claims which are justified by default for me, which are not justified by default for somebody else. I can claim to own another person, but other people cannot claim to own me. This is not universally applied. And you'll note that if you restrict yourself to only those rights which can be universally applied as a principle, then those claims to rights disappear. They cannot be made. That is the beauty of restricting the idea of rights to that which can be universally, universally applied to all humankind. It does nothing. Now there's just going to be this big debate on what makes something universal, which you still haven't made clear, but you seem to base your entire argument on that assumption. Bye-bye now. Have a wonderful day. Now this video has gotten much longer already than I was wanting to make it, so I'm going to wrap it up quickly here. Um, I will stay, say that Stefan's kind of stretching things here, right? Just because a right is a universal principle does not mean that the term right is useless in, in philosophical discussion. Uh, there are good distinctions to be made between other universal principles, such as uh, gravity, which can be considered a universal principle, and the universal principles of human interaction with each other, such as, uh, you know, the principle of charity and uh, universal principles that define what is or is not a just a claim that is justified by default. So the term itself is, is still useful, uh, but I, I get what he's getting at. Uh, we need to restrict very strictly rights to that which is a, a claim that is just by default for everyone, for all human individuals. Anyway, Thank you guys for listening. Uh, please remember to subscribe, to rate the video, leave all your comments below, and I will see you guys later.